going forward, emergency response, emergency preparedness is one of the key things that the city staff uh, trains for, uh, studies for. Uh, we can't be preparing plans after an incident has occurred. It has to be done in advance. And it has to be, to some degree, re retained in memory because you're not going to be able to uh, go back and refer to written documents or such at the time that the incident occurs. Each department head has their own spot with their own set of phone numbers, their own set of information about the capabilities of the departments in particular areas. Uh, they have full-time radio and other backup communications means from that emergency operations center to our employees in the field that may be actually at the site of a disaster. It is set up to make decision making quicker and easier in times when emergency responses are required. Since September the 11th, one of the big things that we've pushed for is an effort towards more interoperable communication so that in an emergency there is uh, a, a process in place to communicate across frequency lines and across jurisdictional lines if need be so that uh, responders from other jurisdictions or responders from other providers can talk to each other. Your preparedness starts with your, with your structure, your infrastructure, and uh, the communication is the backbone of that. And if you don't have good communication and you don't have the capabilities to expand your communication, then you're limited in what you're gonna be able to do out in the field. A tornado is very, uh, it's a short burst major destruction um, and what it hits it tears up. Uh, flood is, uh, is, is a big eye-opener for me is it's totally different in the fact that uh, water only gets up maybe two or three feet but everything that comes out is basically in the bottom half of the house whether it be appliances, carpet and everything. Once the fire is put out or, or once the storm has moved through uh, after we have uh, aided in, in first response, if you would, if we need be, uh, then we kind of, as I said, pick up the pieces. We, we go in and assess the damage, uh, and then we start working with the individuals to, uh, through the rebuild process, which is sometimes, unfortunately, a long process. We are required by the Tennessee Department of Environment Conservation to have an emergency operating plan, and that plan is reviewed annually. We just recently resubmitted ours this year to the state and was approved. Basically, it gives the contact information, both internal to the department and external to media, to other government agencies, uh, to others that might be able to assist us. What you'll find in Murfreesboro City Schools is each school does have an emergency response team. Now, of course, we've had Code Red in place for several years now in working with the police department in developing that, which had to do with intruders. It also had to do with things that like tornadoes, and, and we've had those drills in place for quite a while. But really, we're taking a comprehensive look at it so that, so that not only will we have a district-wide team, but we also will have a team in each school. We have really... Um increased our efforts to really try to get a good plan in place um, through doing preventative things as well as knowing what we're doing after after the crisis happens. So uh, we're really trying to move emergency preparedness on the front burner. So the, the four things that we kind of promote when we're thinking about emergencies is prevention. Prevention to keep from occurring. Preparedness. Preparedness. Properly expectant, organized, or equipped. Ready. Response. Response. An answer or reply to an action. And then the recovery after, after the incident has occurred. Recovery. Return to any form of better condition. First up, prevention. The building code that the city maintains may be one of the best prevention tools that we have. Uh, the professionals that work inspecting new construction, inspecting major remodeling in the building department itself, and the fire marshal's office, both get to put top quality planning into place as that structure is being built. Some of the uh uh, roles that the building codes department would play and the prevention would be uh, to ensure that any new construction or remodeling complies with the current codes and making sure that they meet the, the wind loads and the design criteria uh, for our region 
one of the big changes that we have seen in our building codes was uh, uh, shear walls design. And what shear walls do is protect the structure from racking uh, during high winds. All the new construction has to have the shear walls put in. Nothing's going to prevent a structure from being torn up to a direct hit, but the uh, prevailing winds that come off of it, uh, we have to design for this area for a 90 mile per hour wind and uh, at a three second gust. So what those uh, shear walls do will help maintain the structural integrity of that uh, structure for that time period. Well, our farm marshal division, they go out and inspect on a daily basis. In addition to, uh, we have some uh, captain inspectors that are on duty also. So as a group, they go out and inspect. Public assemblies and assemblies and business occupancies and uh, those type structures, they, they go out and uh, compile data and, and what they look for is uh, compliance as far as uh, the codes and alarm systems to make sure that they're operable and any uh, life safety hazards such as blocked means of egress and things of that nature that they have to go out and ensure public safety. Part of the prevention uh, that, uh, that we participate in is mostly where our guys, when they're working the streets, picking up garbage. There's limbs and things like that that are, uh, that are, uh, that are obstructing uh, different views or something like that. We call Urban Environmental, who does the, the tree trimming for the city, and they take it and, and they get the job done. And then we come over and pick it up or they chip it up. Well, the number one thing that we do is our tree trimming program. And several years ago, we really stepped up this program. We needed to protect our equipment so that when the storms come, when the high winds come, they're not blowing these trees down on the power lines. And we also, when we, when we put up lines and, and the existing lines we have out there now, they're all rated for about a quarter inch of ice and 40 mile an hour winds. We're always doing upgrades and maintenance, trying to get the latest technology out there to help our system stay strong. Preparedness. Well, preparedness really starts with the city's emergency plans. Uh, it is a, a fairly thick notebook of planning that reaches into areas that most folks wouldn't think about. What if the mayor's out of town? What if the city council can't be reached? What if the city manager's out of town? Starting with that kind of chain of control type decision making, uh, who do we bring in, how do we get them there, uh, what is our capabilities to respond, all of that's laid out in a fairly comprehensive plan. Of course the work actually gets done by the people in the various departments of the city and each one of those departments has their own role depending upon what type of emergency we might face. Uh, whether it's the quick response that's needed, whether it's uh, a longer term response, they all have their portions in this plan that are already documented and set in place so that a very quick reference can be made and action can be taken. When you're dealing with emergency responses, uh, that whole process begins with training and begins with the preparedness that precedes any kind of an emergency response. And for the police department, um, training is an ongoing kind of a, a process. We spend thousands of hours every year uh, in career development training and, and different types of training exercises to prepare our police officers and our public safety telecommunicators to be able to respond to and address those situations when they arise. In training for any type of uh, disaster training in, in particular, or specialized training, that it, it's something a little different than, than training for regular fire ground you know, activities. It's a little bit different in that it takes repetition, but, you know, you're not going to get repetition unless you have something, and, and that's, you know, that's not what we're wishing for, but you had to be prepared for it, so we, we try to start out slowly in, in our training, specialized training, and get them to a comfort level, and then just a, ma just a matter of just repetition, 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 until they get better at, at achieving that task. In addition to what we're required to do by the state, for example, when we talk about fire drills, we're required to do at least two the first month of school and then to have one each month. When we talk about earthquake drills, we even are required to have those tornado drills, of which one has to be in March. But what we're doing is really adding to that, and the state has helped us initiate that, and each school district is supposed to have a plan, but what you'll find with us is not only will we have the plan, but we'll also have practiced it.
We really start our preparedness way before something happens and this is what we've learned through the past couple of tornadoes and the floods that we preparedness really is an everyday thing that we need to concentrate on. We also recently this year made a disaster recovery site which we have off campus where we can store all of our information systems, our mapping, our um, GSI system so that if in the event that something happened to our building we're not left there without any maps or any customer data or anything you know to where we can function. We have a new outage management system. The great thing about it is it will map out our outages for us. It will show the area and it can help pinpoint where the problem is, which is going to allow us to know where to go and it's just in the end going to get the power on that much sooner. We also have a new dispatch center. When we have a problem, when we have a really uh, emergency, everything will be controlled from that room. And then the last thing we've done is we have created a partnership with WGNS where we can provide them backup power so that if the power goes out, you know, we can have a generator out there that will get them up immediately so that we can communicate with our customers. Because that's a very important thing. You know, people want to know when the, the lights are going to be back on. They need to make plans. They need to know if they need to get in a hotel or what they need to do. And we want to make sure that we're getting them that information. Preparedness, uh, well the good thing about our guys that run the boom trucks, they're always prepared because that's what they do every day. We run the trucks and we pick up the limbs and brush. Uh, we do not run the chainsaws, so we do not cut, but that our, our focus is, is getting it off the street and then to, uh, to the proper disposal site. And we also cross train all of our employees to where they can actually run the boom or run the garbage trucks because we only pick up garbage uh, four days a week, so on Wednesdays or Saturdays or Sundays when we're out working because of a disaster, they're all there and they're all working to get the same goal, and that's to get us back on our feet just as soon as possible. One of the best things that has helped us prepare is after the first event uh, was some of the debriefing that we did collectively as a city. Uh, when we got all the departments together, we talked about how every, everybody responded, what everybody's role was, and uh, then you could actually sit back and, and look at uh, how everybody responded and critique our response. So that was some of the best uh, as far as future preparedness is looking back on what we've done and then how we're going to address and how we're going to respond in the future. Well, in, in preparing, a lot of times we've, it's lessons learned we have. In particular, we purchased three trailer-mounted electric generators that could be uh, taken out to remote sites and operate a pump station that may be without power for an extended period. We also have what's called a silent pump. It's a uh, diesel-driven pump, uh, diesel-motor-driven pump that we can uh, basically do the same thing when power is not available or if we need to do maintenance on, on a pump station so that when power from the utility side is restored, it, it, uh, we just go back, unplug it, and uh, throw the switch, and we're back on utility power. Response. The, the first employees that will arrive on the scene of an emergency are generally going to be public safety, uh, whether that's police in an initial response or the fire department with a more coordinated response from hazardous materials or some other uh, area. Those are the folks that you're going to see first on the scene when a disaster occurs. And as such, both police and fire departments spend a, a fair amount of their training time during the year focused on these emergency response efforts and how, how, how they respond, when they respond, and how quickly they can respond. Our response protocol in any, any given emergency is that the, uh, the on-duty personnel will respond. They will respond and as to whether or not they stage it, it all depends on the call itself. We uh, implemented an, uh, an all page, an all text to where we can just, uh, by computer, send out an all text to all, uh, to all personnel and they will get that message and understand that that's an emergency that they need to respond to, you know, whether they go to an assigned location or not, but they've got, they've got the word. Our dispatch operates through over the police department and the, uh, their protocol as well as ours is that they'll, they'll get automatic dispatch. Our main concern, which, you know, that, that's on any situation, is life safety and trying to mitigate and try to, try to, to, to lessen the likelihood of fatalities. And uh, 
we have to address the hazards, which were down electrical lines, whether it was uh, utilities such as gas and things of that nature that have ruptured. We have to, to, to isolate and mitigate those as well as to mark and identify structures as far as whether it's occupied, whether it's a rescue situation, or whether it's fatalities present in that, in that location. That first hour or so is very uh, chaotic. You've got damage, you've got people who are injured, you've got street closures, you've got uh, calls to loved ones who are in the path of the tornado who, uh, where you've had personal injury or property damage. And so it takes a little time to uh, respond, secure those areas, render aid to the victims, and, and, and really get your plan uh, in place. The incident command system and the emergency operations plan help us prepare for that. And it means basically that uh, police officers know what their responsibilities are. They understand how that system works. Uh, command posts are set up at specified locations depending on what the incident is. When, when we talk about the response, we're, we're talking about not only what will happen with the children and with the teachers, but we're also talking about how we communicate that to parents, how we communicate that to media. So within each one of these separate areas, you are going to have a pretty comprehensive media plan. You're going to have a pretty comprehensive plan for how do we communicate with parents, because that's important. Not only are we going to have that, but you're also going to see planning with other emergency agencies. For example, if we need to evacuate the students, can we use some of the other equipment that the other agencies would have? And the answer is yes. On the other hand, if they need our school buses for their services, then can we do that? So, so we really are coordinating with the other agencies as far as response. The very first thing we do when the emergency happens, um, say it's a tornado or high winds or whatever, is we have to send out damage assessment teams. These teams, they may be line crew, they may be part of our engineering staff. They're gonna go out and assess the damage so that we know exactly what we're talking about here. Is this just one street? Is this a whole substation? You know, is this scattered such as an ice storm? It would be all over town. You know, so we've gotta, we've gotta figure out what the problem is before we can actually have a plan of action. And you know, when the power lines are down, unfortunately, when they go down, you're not gonna have a police officer there that instant or the electric department there that instant to say stay away so we just need um, we need our customers to to just stop and think when that happens and think and always assume that the wire is live always um, if you're stuck in your car in that situation the safest place to be is in your car. I mean, you need to remember that you're sitting on four big tires that are gonna insulate you. So as long as you can stay in your car, don't really touch anything metal, you're gonna be okay. In the situation to where your car might be on fire um, and you have to get out, you need to remember, first of all, to not panic. I mean, you need to keep your head about you. Open your car door, um, but stay inside. Just open it, keep everything inside. Turn your whole body toward the door once you get it open. Make sure you don't touch anything metal. And then you're going to jump free of your car. You need to keep in a tight ball and you shuffle away as quickly as possible. And the key is to not touch the car or the ground at the same time. So you need to make sure that you, that you leap free of that. And of course, these are extreme situations that we hope that no one has to deal with. But in the case of the tornado, there were down power lines. They were going across the street. Don't drive over them. Stay away from them. And if you can stop and keep everybody away from them as well, you know, that's a plus until emergency management people can get there. The Building Codes Department responds to natural disasters, uh, tornadoes we had, we responded to those. The flooding, we responded to those. And we also respond to uh, certain types of fires. So immediately after, after we look to make sure the structures, that there's no one in them, then we come back and we start assessing those for, can we get the power back on? Can we get the utilities back on? Can we get those people moved back in their homes where they're not displaced? Uh, and we have people on the ground in teams working uh, areas of the city to try to make those assessments as quick as we can so that we can get people back in their homes. Now, naturally, if they uh, are destroyed or if, they are, if there's electrical problems, if, there's, if they're a hazard and they couldn't move in, then we have to placard those homes and then we start the process of, uh, you know, where people come in and start rebuilding their homes to try to get them habitable again. Well, there are, are diver, different levels of response depending on the emergency. It could be 
a water line break, there's a, a sewer overflow, uh, power outage or whatever. Uh, we have monitoring of, of our, most of our systems uh, continually and uh, if it doesn't go awry then uh, we have people that are on call that respond to those emergencies. If it's more a general emergency that includes all city departments or Rutherford County, then the city manager will uh, call and say that the command center is open and uh, my staff and I go to the command center and from there we contact our uh, subordinates and those people that uh, do the work in the field. The Solid Waste Department has been able to uh, respond in different areas and in different ways because um, even though uh, the Solid Waste Department our main focus is picking up garbage and even though uh, we may have the tornado we still picked up garbage but we also responded uh, to the cleanup efforts and also first response of cleaning off the roads so that emergency crews could come through and make their checks like the fire department going through making sure that nobody was in the houses and things like that like in the floods where we don't actually go and block off streets, you know, say in low water and stuff. It's like we were able to respond by taking a couple of our boom trucks and actually going out and working with the county uh, employees and cleaning up some of the flood damaged areas out in the county. So both disasters are totally different. Recovery. After the emergency has passed and, and people's needs have been met, uh, oftentimes there's still uh, a lot of situations to deal with, whether it's debris uh, or other types of damage. And that's where you see other city departments that uh, step up and take significant roles in the recovery phase from a disaster. Once the incident has, has ceased, if it's, a, if it's a major storm, if it's some other type of catastrophe, uh, I think the first things that you have to do, obviously, is render aid to the victims. Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, that they're taken care of and the appropriate medical needs are provided. Then the next thing, obviously, that we're going to be looking at is the safety and security of the scene. That means, in a lot of cases, um, setting up checkpoints, roadblocks, making sure that only authorized people are allowed into neighborhoods. And as you might imagine, immediately following a major event like that, that's difficult because uh, people are concerned about their families, they're concerned about their residences, they're concerned about their belongings. Um, and so the police have to be very uh, uh, understanding and compassionate while at the same time doing what they can to maintain the safety and security of those neighborhoods. In the recovery phases of uh, cleanup, and depending on different types of disasters and things, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration, they have very strict rules that we have to follow. Uh, certain things that we have to do has to be brought out to the curb and, uh, and, and it has to be segregated into how that we can take the material. White goods, building construction debris, limbs and brush. And the reason why we do that is, is because we try to, uh, to limit the amount that goes to um, the C&D landfill. There's no sense in filling up a landfill with limbs and brush if we have the facility that can take the limbs and brush and to create mulch. And also, if you take the, uh, the appliances and things like that to a scrap metal dealer. We are responsible to go in and assess the damage uh, then permits will be issued to licensed contractors and oversee the re basically uh, the rebuilding of them and go through and approve them ultimately at the end whether for electrical, plumbing, mechanical and sign off on those to be uh, to get the power back on to get people back in. Well in, in recovery uh, for instance in the tornado the main thrust of our recovery was there were some 80 homes that were destroyed and are being rebuilt we went out and disconnected them from the sewer. We uh, disconnected them from the water system. Uh, over time, you know, working with insurance companies and things, the people have, have started to reconstruct. And when they get to a certain point, we go back out and reconnect the, the water service and the sewer service to the home. On the recovery process, you know, our goal with any outage, whether it is a thousand customers or twenty thousand customers, is to get the the most amount of customers on in the quickest amount of time. 
We also prioritize on um, critical facilities. So we're gonna wanna make sure we get the hospital back on, the emergency management uh, facilities back on, the water treatment plant, the sewer treatment plant, you know, things that are critical to our, our customers, uh, along with electricity, we need to get those facilities up and running first. So that's kinda how we can kinda prioritize things. When we talk about recovery, it's very similar to response. So how do you get things back to normal? And when we're talking about that, we are talking about the emotional aspects that can happen. So very much be involved with the guidance center, very much be involved with our social worker and our psychologist so that when we do have a something that happens at a school, you are going to find all of our resources going there. Well, the main thing as far as recovering, the one thing that we focused on, and I hate to keep reverting back to the tornado, was that our main focus at that time when we were going through our recovery period was to make sure that our presence was in the communities, to make sure that they knew that we were there, we were available. Yes, we did respond, and, and our men and women are tired, but we're still there, we're still helping, and I wanted everybody to know that, that we haven't given up on this situation, we're still working, so we're going we're gonna to be here until the job's done. No disaster is alike. Every situation has to be dealt with individually. It's still important that we plan for the basics. Who's in charge? Who's going to respond? How do we respond? With what do we respond? Uh, those things will change, but the city's staff is committed to keep on top of items and issues that come up in emergency preparedness and try to keep us at the, the forefront of being able to deal with any disaster.